weekend, we'll have about 35, 40 college students who are getting ready to lead this year in Chi Alpha, a Christian ministry out on campus here, uh, and we're going to be getting ready for the start of the new school year. So, super grateful for you guys for hosting us and, uh, and making breakfast, so that's awesome. Uh, I was told that you guys normally have the kids come on up at this time. Cool, cool. Awesome. How awesome is this? You got, you got your Gatorade? You want to say hi to you in the Come on. Uh, and, and then we'll pray for you guys, and then you're going to be going to the first group. So, how you guys doing? Good. Yeah? How many of you guys with the kids? What? Yeah? How, what was the best part of kids camp? Uh, jet skis. The jet skis? Did they let you drive it? Yeah. Did they, did they, did they like you drive it? No. no? Uh, maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, let's pray for you guys, and then we're going to have you go down the stairs for your lesson with uh, Richard. So, God, we just thank you for these <coughs> awesome kids, and we thank you that they're part of this church. And, God, we just pray that uh, even today, God, that, that you would show yourself to them, that they'd learn about you, and uh, that they would just have a ton of fun doing it. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, will you guys can head down with Richard. No running. No running. No running. No running. No running. <laughs> No <laughs> well, I am actually, I'm getting off of a week of vacation, and your pastor, uh, Andrew, was like, hey, would you mind filling in? I was like, yeah, I'll be coming in uh, that day. And so I just spent a week up at a lake in Michigan. And have you really even had a Midwest summer until you spent some time on a lake? Like, that's just, I was trying to explain to a friend who's never really been to the Midwest, like, what is Midwest culture in the summer? I was like, you find a friend or somebody who has a cabin or a cottage uh, somewhere on a lake, and you just like find a way to get there and swim around a little bit. And so uh, it, it's a great privilege to be here. I love Andrew and Rachel so much. Uh, we get together frequently, grab coffee, and just talk about life and, and ministry and all that good stuff. And so, uh, and how many of you were here for the Good Friday service? Uh, it was a little while back, but we got to do that together with a few different pockets of, of people. And, and man, I, I enjoyed that, love that. And so. Um, glad to be with you. I uh, I know some of your kids just got back from Spencer Lake Summer Camp. I spend the month of July up there with all of the high schoolers and junior hires. And uh, let me tell you, there's nothing like uh, a week full of teenage angst. Um, <laughs> but I love it. I, I've, been, uh, I've been helping out there for about seven, eight years now uh, as the program director. And it's, uh, it's amazing. It's incredible. And we see God do so many things. And the, whether, uh, for me, working with college students or working with high school students, which is what I primarily do, there is something just amazing and incredible about being around people in that age group. There, there's some energy and, and passion that you just can't replicate um, anywhere else. And, uh, and so, uh, man, I hope that in the middle of this summer, I hope that in the middle of hopefully relaxing a little bit, of, of maybe trying to slow the pace of life down a little bit, that you're also getting a, a chance to really kind of recalibrate, refocus, and, and ask yourself, like, what does God have for me in this next season of life? And I know as a church, you've been in this season, you've been asking this question, it's been an exciting time, as Pastor Andy's kind of like taken over, and, and you guys have been asking this question, like, who are we going to be, and, and, and how are we going to accomplish what God has for this church? And so I hope that this summer, in the middle of maybe hopping on a pontoon boat or getting in the lake, is that you've also had a chance to really like spend some beautiful, amazing time with Christ. And so this morning, I want to share a message that is only fitting for me to share because I am a, uh, a pastor of UW Madison College students, and I'm going to title to this, this morning's talk called Jump Around, Jump Around, and I'm going to read out of Philippians 3, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians 3, and Paul is writing to a church that he started. He's writing to people that he loves dearly, that he loves passionately, uh, but he's writing in chains. He's writing in prison. He's writing in, in a time when he, this may be his last real communication with these people that he has kind of walked with from uh, kind of the first knowing Jesus to now and this next season of life where they've walked with Jesus for a little bit. 
And he's writing uh, to encourage, he's writing, but also to help them remember and, and, and stay in tune and stay connected to what Jesus had originally started doing in their lives. And so we're going to read in Philippians 3, starting in verse 7, and it says this. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I now consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is found, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me one last time this morning? God. Jesus, we love you. We recognize that you're in this place this morning, that, that you're at work in our lives. And, and God, we want to just open up our heart, posture our lives, posture our souls and our minds to be open to hear from you, to allow your Holy Spirit to guide us and challenge us and direct us, to, to highlight areas of our lives that we need to change and, and, and to speak hope and life into areas that, that need restoration. And so God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I also want to read for you uh, this beautiful poem that I did not write. It goes like this. Pack it up, pack it in, let me begin. I came to win, battle me, that's a sin. I will never slack up, punk you better back up. Try and play the role, and you'll the whole crew will act up. Get up, stand up, come on, throw your hands up. If you got the feeling, jump across the ceiling. Mugs lift the funk, flow, someone's talking junk. Yo, I bust them in the eye, and then I'll take the punk's girlfriend. Feeling funky and amps from the trunk, and I got more rhymes, and there's cops at a Dunkin' Donuts shop showing up. I got props from the kids on the hill, plus my mom and my pops. I came to get down, I came to get down, so get out of your seat and jump around. Jump around, jump around, jump around, jump up, jump up, and get down. Do you guys know this poem? Do you know this song? <laughs> Anyone, like, come to church expecting to hear this beautiful poem from House of Pain called Jump Around. Uh, well, I just read to you the lyrics of one of UW Madison's most time-honored tradition, and that is the playing of the song Jump Around uh, at the end of the third quarter, at, uh, going into the start of the fourth quarter. This tradition began on Saturday, October 10th, 1998, at the Badger Hope at the Badgers' homecoming game against the Purdue Boilermakers. And no offense, Andrew, but I don't know why Purdue even has a football team. <laughs> After no offensive points were scored in the third quarter, the Badgers' marketing agent in charge of the sound piped the song through the loudspeakers and stirred up the fans and players and has become a tradition of the last decade. Thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how much you dive into a Madison game day. Uh, for me, working again primarily with college students at UW-Madison, it is a big deal. Uh, and essentially don't make any plans on a Saturday in the fall because everyone's going to be consumed with the football game. Uh, which for me, I love. I love football. Uh, I love playing football. I love watching football. But it is it's an amazing atmosphere. Uh, it, it's one of the. It's actually ranked as one of the best college football sports traditions. Uh, and actually, from my house, if I open up my door, I can hear the song being played. It's awesome. It's amazing. Uh, we took our uh, my oldest son, who's now six, to his first Badger game last fall, and that was his favorite moment. Really, that was the only moment that and the ice cream that we gave him. Uh, but there's something amazing, something special. Uh, that happens for a brief moment, 80,000 people lose their minds for one reason. Middle-aged men who are trying to relive their glory days and who have somehow found themselves in the student section are jumping around. Small children in adorable tiny badger jerseys are jumping around. Old ladies and old men who uh, barely walk are jumping around. Uh, I, last year at a game, I met a couple who was 
they were 82 years old, and they were jumping up and down during the song. Frats and sororities jumped side by side in perfect unison. Band members holding tubas are jumping around. People are throwing other people in the air while jumping around. Freshmen who have never been to a football game are jumping around, and foreign exchange students who have no idea what this game even is for a brief moment are jumping around. Even other teams and other coaches get caught up in this moment, and for a minute and a half until the song swears and they turn it off, you get a small glimpse of something special of 80,000 people being fully aligned in perfect unison for a cause. It's one of those things that, that people get their phones out for, that people talk about, but it doesn't really matter how much I talk about it or try to paint the picture of it or even you see somebody else talk about it. Until you have experienced that moment, you don't really understand like the craziness of it all. Do you, have you ever been a part of something like that? That, that it, Words can't quite describe it. No matter how much you try to paint the picture, no matter how much you read about it or study on it, 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 it doesn't do it justice until you have walked through it. Until you have experienced it, there's a disconnect from a, a, of understanding of what something is. Have you ever had anything like this? And, and if you're a parent, this is parenting. I thought I knew what parenting was, and then I had a kid, and then I had another kid, and another kid, and, and here's the deal. Until you have a kid, you don't really fully understand what it takes to be a parent. There's a gap in knowledge. There's a gap in learning. Until you understand the responsibility of loving and bringing somebody up. If you have ever been married, it's one of those things. You watch movies about it, or you read about it, or you hear about it, or you've even seen other people be a part of it. But until you yourself have walked down that aisle and made those vows, there's a gap in it. It's one of those things that until you have fully experienced it, until you have walked it out, until you have lived it, it's almost too hard to explain. It's almost too hard to, to really, it's one of those things that you have to fully experience to understand. And for those of us who have ever encountered the amazing grace and love of Jesus Christ, this should be our experience. That no matter how much we talk about Jesus, no matter how many songs we sing about Jesus, that until people have walked and, and received His grace, until people have had a moment of revelation, of understanding the goodness and the love of Christ, it is one of those things that, that, that you can't understand it by just reading about it. You can't understand it by just observing it from afar. You can only fully understand it when you have submerged yourself deeply, passionately into it. And Paul is writing to people that he loves dearly, people that he has experienced life with, people that he has experienced hardship with, people that he has experienced the miraculous with, and he's writing in chains, and this might be his last communication with him, and he's saying, I, man, everything in life, if I'm writing my final words to you, if I'm writing my final encouragement to you, I want to remind you that there's one purpose to life, that there's one focus to life, that every, I, I, I thought I had understood accomplishment, I thought I had understood the meaning of life, and then I encountered the grace of Jesus Christ, and it changed everything, and everything else fought, felt so meaningless, so purposeless, without it being centered and rooted in Jesus Christ. Christ. He's writing to people to remind them to, to be focused, to stay about the main thing. He actually says, uh, everything else is garbage. Hey, if I could go back, I wouldn't waste my time on meaningless things. I wouldn't waste my time on anything that was disjointed or separate from living fully alive, fully passionate with Jesus. He is almost, uh, he's almost explaining something that's, that's too hard to explain. He's almost uh, explaining something that you have to experience, that you would have to really dive into to fully understand. So this morning, I want to ask us three questions about our lives. Three questions uh, about this idea of jump around. The first question is, what makes you jump around? Do you have something in your life? Do you have things in your life? Do you have a job? Do you have relationships? Do you have passions in your life that you care more about than anything else in the world? 
Have you found something in life that you're all in on, just like in a camp or in a moment where everybody is fully committed, people don't care how embarrassed they look because in that moment they're committed to, the, to what is going on? Have you found something like that for your life that isn't just momentary, that isn't a few seconds, that isn't a minute and a half, but have you found things to be truly passionate about? Have you found things that have given your life meaning and purpose? Have you found something to go all in on? Have you found something that you're willing to give up time and money and energy for because you care more about that than you care about anything else? I think one of the easiest ways, uh, one of the best questions to figure this out is, what do you love enough to fight somebody over? I remember in uh, the fourth grade, I remember Kyle Wilson. Uh, I don't know why. I was not a small fourth grader, and Kyle was. But Kyle, for some reason, decided to talk about my mom. And my dad was adamant that if anyone talks about your family, you can defend your family. And I was like, Kyle, are you, are you serious right now? I know you're not talking about Don Koistra. He continued to make fun of my mom. And I said, Kyle, I am going to fight you at recess. Uh, so at recess, I walked out to the tire swings where Kyle was. I pulled him off the tire swing and punched Kyle in his little glasses. It was foolish of me because I also did it right in front of the teacher's lounge and was suspended. But do you have something that you love enough that you will defend? Do you love, have you found something, have you found people, have you found a cause that you love enough that uh, you would actually stand up for, that you would actually say, hey, no, I, if somebody was opposed to that, I have to stand my ground on this because I love this thing more than I care about social norms. More than I care about what's politically correct, I care about this thing. Have you found, so I mean, I hope... That, that in life, you find something that you're passionate for. Most of what I do when I sit down with college students is I encourage them to find something that they will be passionate about. And I, for me, for a lot of us in this room, this is Jesus Christ. Or at least on paper, we put that this is Jesus Christ. But I want to live a life that doesn't just have my priorities on paper, but it has my priorities through how I live and through how I speak and through how I act. I want to be the type of person that doesn't just live a, a passive or nominal life. I want to be somebody who finds the things that I'm passionate about and that I would position my life to accomplish those passions and live in those passions have you found those things for your life? Oftentimes, like I mentioned, I get to sit with people who are brilliant, who are giving phenomenal degrees from a phenomenal university, or who have phenomenal uh, side hobbies or passions or, or interests. But have you found something that sustains you? Have you found something that anchors you? Have you found something that, that, that you would more or less jump around for? If people look at the substance of your life, it would be very clear to them, this is what you are about, this is how you are prioritized, and this is how you are motivated and driven. There's nothing, nothing worse than, than being around, and I think this is the danger uh, of being in uh, America, is that it is easy to become passive, it's easy to, to become nominal, it's easy to go through the motions, and it's easy to do this in our faith. It's easy to show up and, and go through the routines. It's easy to come when I can and not come when I can't. But the language we use about the gospel, the language Paul uses and the other authors use in the gospel, right? I, was, I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was bound up in, in, in chains. I once was shackled. I once was in sin and brokenness, but now I'm alive. Now I've been made new. Do you see that it's polarizing? That the gospel is naturally a polarizing context and passage. Like there's not really a lot of space for a passive middle, and yet we live in a culture that primarily thrives in a passive middle. Have you found things to go all in on? Has this been your experience of walking with Jesus? Have you ever had that moment where, where you have felt fully free and fully alive? Have you ever had that moment where you've encountered his goodness and his love and it's washed over you? Have you ever had that season of life where, where you've had a vision of where he wanted to take you and what he wanted to do in your life and you've walked towards that? And I hope that you have. I hope that, that if you came here looking this morning that you would look no further 
And, and then you would, uh, like Paul says, I, I abandon everything else. I get rid of everything else. And it doesn't mean I, I do this like, it, it just means I, I prioritize everything in the direction of Jesus because I've found that he's the only one that sustains my soul. Paul is writing to the Philippian church that was started out of him being in chains and now he's writing to them in chains. You know the story of Philippi? Paul writes, he's bound up in prison, but he loves Jesus so much he starts worshiping Jesus and the prison doors fly open. And this is the starting point for this church. And this is why he reminds them, do you not remember how you started in the middle of a hard season, in the middle of hardship, through worship, through prayer, through passion, this church was started. Don't lose sight of that now that you've journeyed with Jesus a little bit. Don't lose sight of that now because it is become more normal to sing about him and talk about him. Don't let your, your faith be minimized be, uh, because you walk with him a little bit longer. But my question for you this morning, if you were to look at the substance of your life, I want you to do this even for a few moments. Think about where do I spend the majority of my money? What does it get allocated towards? What does it get spent on? Where do I spend the majority of my time? What do I think about the most? Whose words, whose thoughts impact me the most? And think, if, if you're somebody who says, man, I, I'm a follower of Christ, is that rooted all in Jesus? Those things aren't bad. Having money is not a bad thing. Having a job is a great thing. Having a home is a great thing. But it's an even better thing. It's a gospel thing when it's rooted in the heart of Christ. What makes you jump around? It's a good question. It's a good thing to wrestle with. Do I have something that I'm passionate about? Do I have something that I focus on? Our second question is, what makes heaven jump around? Have you ever asked that question? What makes heaven jump around? What would make heaven like, look like Camp Randall? What would make heaven look like uh, you know, 80,000 people all in one use? What gets heaven excited? Well, there's two things that are talked about in the gospel that get heaven excited. One is the glory and the majesty of God and or Jesus simultaneously in the Old Testament and the New Testament there it talks about how the heavens roar, uh, erupt or roar or, or get loud at uh, the majesty of God. And the second is actually lost people being found. The Apostle John gives us a glimpse into heaven in Revelation 5 verses 11 through 14 it says this, he has a vision of heaven. It says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the sea uh, and, and under the earth and on the sea and all of them were saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever. John paints this picture twice. He, he gives this narrative twice. Uh, and, and scripture, oftentimes, when something's repeated, is because they're trying to make this emphasis. They're trying to make this emphatic point. But no matter realizing that no matter how many times they reiterate it, is there still going to be a disconnect? And so John's trying to give you this picture, knowing that you'll never be able to fully grasp this picture. But he says this: he says, picture. Thousands upon thousands. Picture the largest crowd you've ever seen. Picture the most people you've ever been in a room with, the biggest concert, the biggest venue you've ever been in, and everyone is so captured and enamored with Christ on the throne, and they're saying, worthy is the Lamb. This man who was killed on a cross, he's the only one who's worthy. And he, he is worthy to receive all power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then he has to say it again because like I had a picture, but you were picturing thousands, picture, picture not just one stadium, picture every stadium you can picture and that amount of people all at the same time, all in one voice, not singing, jump around, but saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. He's trying to make this point, like, what gets heaven excited is Jesus. 
that even in this room, you may be looking around and saying, man, there's some empty chairs in this place. It's, there, it's actually not. It's full of God's presence doing one thing, declaring His glory, declaring His majesty, declaring how good He is, declaring how, how amazing He is. H have you, like been in that place with Jesus where you're so infatuated and blown away by who he is? Have you seen him working in your life in such an amazing way, but you can't help but sing, like, word God, Jesus, I can't eat, you're amazing, you're incredible, I, I can't sing it enough, I can't spend enough time with you because you are incredible. Do you remember, like, your very first relationship ever? Like the very first time you have that like you crushed really, really hard on something, right? Like you have this for a moment where you would position your life to like intersect with theirs on any place, any time you could. You would talk to them far too much. You know, like you would just like went dark for a season. Your friends didn't know where you were. You're here. Like your parents didn't know why because you had fought, like you thought you had fallen in love with someone. Have you had this moment with Jesus lately? Have you lived in this presence of his grace? Have you lived in his goodness? Have you lived in, in, in just like loving him well? This is what gets heaven up out of their seats. This is what gets like the spiritual world, like all spiritual gifts rally around this one thing of making a big deal of Jesus. Of lifting high who he is and where he belongs. But there's also a second thing. Uh, Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 15, and he actually tells three separate stories, and they're amazing stories about uh, lost people being found, about people who are very far from Jesus now being and having the opportunity to be found, and in all three stories, he also makes mention of this idea that heaven gets excited, heaven rejoices when lost people are found. Luke 15, 7, it says this, I tell you, Jesus is talking, he says this, he says, I tell you in the same way that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus says this, he, he says, like, all of heaven it will rejoice, all of heaven will get excited, all of the, the word he's, the language he's using there is not just rejoice like a, yay, that's kind of cool, no, it's like heaven erupts, heaven gets excited when people realize, like, I am lost without Jesus, I need his grace, the 99 people just showing up to a church service and saying, I'm good, thanks Jesus, that was a nice time we had a few years ago. All of heaven, get, like, loses their mind when people want to enter in to this narrative of worshiping Jesus. Like in Revelations, though, Jesus repeats this almost identical language. Why? Because he's trying to explain something that unless you've experienced it, he, he can't say it enough, but he's trying to paint the picture for you. In Luke 15, 10, he says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent uses the exact same language to try to reiterate this point, that when people turn their heart to Jesus, all of heaven joins with them. That in your own life, when you have conviction, and so you, you ask for forgiveness, it's not a moment of shame, but it's all actually heaven joining with you, saying, yes, you know what, you can't do it on your own. You're right. You are broken and incomplete with Jesus, but now you're turning your heart back to him. And so we're going to join in with you, and we're just as excited for this moment where you're turning your heart back to Christ as we were as many times as you've done this before. Gives us imagery that when you embrace Jesus, all of heaven joins with you. Why? Because Jesus is in love with you. Jesus is all in on you. And this is the kingdom of God, is that we go 100% all in on Christ, and Christ in return, uh, before we ever initiate anything, has shown his heart, has shown his motive, which is to be all in on us. You want to know like, what makes Jesus jump around? It's people. It's the people that he's, he's created and loved. I love Psalms 139. And it's my favorite psalm. And it paints this picture. David's writing, and he writes this. He says, Lord, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I set out on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will uh, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And I love verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. What a beautiful passage. It paints this picture. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus cares about you. That Jesus gets excited and anticipates a life with you. That you could never walk through something too hard. That he wouldn't want to be present and walk with you through it. And you can never have too joyous of a moment that you wouldn't want to celebrate with you. That no matter where you are in life, whether you're in a great season or a desert season, whether your heart is full of life and joy this morning, or whether you are drained and full of anxiousness and depression, that Jesus loves you and he cares for you and he's all in on you. And this is why all of heaven is all in on Jesus. Amy, I'm going to invite you to come up and play as we get ready to wrap up. My hope and my prayer is that some of you will, will, will walk or turn your hearts back to doing what all of heaven is doing, and that is to making a big deal out of Jesus Christ, to glorifying Him with every moment, with every job, with every task you have to do, but also to be somebody who, who joins in and seeing lost people be found who celebrates what Jesus celebrates, who goes all in on what Jesus is all in, that's people who are far from him, knowing the goodness and love of his grace. Last question, and this is uh, probably the most important question, what makes Jesus jump around? If all of heaven is going nuts, losing their mind, jumping around for Jesus, what actually gets Jesus excited? If you love Jesus, or maybe even if you don't, this is a great question to ask. This is probably the best question you can ask. But what gets Jesus up out of his chair? What gets Jesus, and what gets Jesus so excited that he can't stay passive? There's a story in Acts. Uh, Jesus, by this time, has gone to the cross, and he has died and, and been raised to life. He's spent some time with his disciples, and he's ascended into heaven. One of his followers, a man named Stephen, <coughs> He, man, you talk about a life that personifies being all in on Christ. This is Stephen. And, and quickly, Stephen starts to proclaim to everyone he meets, everyone he knows. Like, it, he, he lived out Philippians 3, where he abandons everything for the cause of Christ. And so he starts proclaiming the story of Jesus everywhere he goes and every moment that he can. And this gets him in some trouble, and some religious people, they're, they're like so furious that he would proclaim the resurrection of Christ. But he can't help himself, he can't contain, because he's experienced something that unless you've experienced, it's too hard to put it into words. But he's encountered something that's so life-changing, so life-altering, that he can't help himself but proclaim the story of Jesus. Because he's found something that he's all in on. So he starts, he, he continues to the point where the religious leaders take Stephen and say, if you proclaim Jesus, we're going to kill you. And so they wrongfully, uh, they wrongfully try him and they get ready to, to, they're getting ready to kill him. And in Acts 7, verse uh, 54 through 56, this is what happens at the end of Stephen's life as he's getting buried, as he's getting ready to give up his last breath on this earth. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, the religious people who had, who had tried him, told him to stop talking about Jesus, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now this matters because there's many verses, or there's a number of verses, where it talks about Jesus, right, in Revelation, where he's seated at the right hand, and he's dignified, and he's being worshipped, and he's being highlighted as somebody who, who deserves to be seated at the right hand. But in this moment, what Stephen sees is not a dignified, passive Jesus, but a Jesus who can't help himself but get up out of his seat. 
It's actually stronger language than him just standing up. It actually paints this picture of that camp in the moment of what gets Jesus to jump around, what gets Jesus to cheer you on, where, where Jesus like, wants to join in, where he's moved by how someone's living. It's this moment when someone gets to the spot in their life where they surrender everything, when someone gets to the spot in their life where they give up every dollar, every thought, every moment, every energy that they have for the glory of God, he can't help but get up out of his chair and cheer him on home. What gets Jesus up out of the seat is when we have lives that don't just repent and say, Jesus, I need you to just heal me and redeem me. But when we live lives and say, I, want, I, I don't want just your redemption, but I want to be somebody who built your kingdom. I don't want to just be a recipient of your love. I've got to let it go out into the world because it's too good to just hold in. It's too good to just keep to myself. It's too good to be true. And until people experience the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, uh, they don't even know what they're missing. It answers this question, what gets Jesus up out of his seat, our lives that are fully surrendered? So there's two ways to read Psalms 139. That yes, Jesus, I'm struggling today, and no matter where I go, I, I hope that your love and your grace is there. Yes, that is one way to read it. But also, Jesus, in my lowest moment, I hope that I proclaim who you are, and I hope that I worship you. Jesus, even when it's the dark of night, even when my soul is anxious, Jesus, even then, let me point to your glory. Jesus, at the best moments of my life, let me give all the credit back to you. Jesus, in the happiest moments of my life, let me be somebody who witnesses and proclaims the goodness of who you are with every breath, with every moment. I count everything else as garbage. I count everything else as a loss for the surpassing knowledge of knowing the goodness of Jesus Christ. That is what gets Jesus up out of the sea. And I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that gets Jesus up out of his seat. I don't want to live a life that's passive. I don't want to live a life that's apathetic. I don't want to live a life that just like gets me through to heaven. I want to live a life that is full of purpose, that is rich in meaning, that is rich of uh, 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 anticipating every moment of walking hand in hand with my Savior. Why? Because I've experienced a love that is too good to not be life altering. I've experienced a grace that's too good to not transform me. I've experienced a relationship that has now altered every other relationship of my life, and it's the relationship of knowing my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you do this this morning? Would you close your eyes for a few moments as we process this? Three questions. How are you engaging these three questions? Have you found something that gets you up out of your seat? Have you found something you want to fight for? Have you found something that you care about? Have you found something that you're willing to sacrifice for? That you're willing to give up time and energy and emotion for? Have you been aware of what gets heaven excited? Have you been aware of the glory of Jesus? And have you been aware of how excited heaven is when lost people are found? question, do you want to engage in a life that gets Jesus up out of the seat, that gets him cheering you along as you live for the primary cause of all of life, and that is to build the kingdom of God. This morning, with every eye closed, if you're in this place, and maybe you've never encountered the loving grace of Jesus Christ, and you're hearing me talk about it, or you've seen other people talk about it, or Pastor Andrew and other weeks talk about it, but man, it hasn't been like how we've described it. It hasn't been this life altering moment. And this morning, you're saying, I want to encounter the life changing relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? We just want to be able to pray for you. Awesome. Second, if you're in this place, and man, maybe you kind of become a little too monotonous in your relationship with Christ, you, you become a little stale little bored this morning you're, you're getting that picture of heaven going crazy of Jesus wanting to cheer you along as you build the kingdom of God you're saying man I want to go all in I'm Jesus once again I want to be useful for the kingdom of God again if that's you would you just raise your hand so we can pray for you yeah God 
We pray for these hands, God. I pray, I'll raise my own hand. Jesus, would you help me? Would you help us? Would you help this community to be people who go all in? That the loudest noise in Madison wouldn't be a game day. It wouldn't be a football game. But it would be the people of God making a big deal of a relationship of a Savior who, who's too good to just put into words. He's too good to just describe or want to learn about. But, but he, he's too good to be true. That when we meet people who, who find ways to align our work to glorify you, to align our neighborhoods and our living situations to glorify you, to align our habits and our routines and our schedules to glorify you. God, we love you in this place. God, we want to know you in a deeper way. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand. It, it, uh, man, it really is. It's an honor to, to get to be with you guys and get to pastor in the same city as your pastor. I, I love them dearly. I hope that you'll come back again next week. Uh, pastor Andrew will be back. And I uh, hope that you have a great week as you go out and spend a lot of time with Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed.